Hello, everyone, and welcome to This Week in Hospitality Marketing Live show number 423. I am your host, Lauren Gray, and thank you for joining us today. Um, gosh, uh, and, and, and kind of maybe subliminally, unconsciously, I tied together several of our uh, uh, context of what we're doing. I, I, I try to keep our show each week relevant to the week that we're in, obviously, and I we do it live so that it's always current to the conversations that are happening in our industry for this particular week. But uh, like I said, maybe subconsciously, I created a theme through the past few uh, shows that have turned into more of a um, three-part series, four-part series. Uh, it started back with uh, show, four, is it, I think, 420... One, no, it's actually 422. Um, nope, it's going to be 421. Sorry, let's go back. 421 was the show, How to Stress Test Your Market Budget, which was basically talking about how to take your existing data and go backwards and uh, modify it in negative ways and in variable ways to see how you would preemptive or, or potentially proactively adjust what you were doing given those circumstances you're artificially created. We created this scenario of the pilot training program, so to speak, where they're put into a simulator and given all these variations to actually first person handle so that they become better should the same circumstance happen in real life. And that was our show 421, beginning this month. We started talking about that. Then we dropped into uh, show 422, where we then talked about the coin being flipped. Rather than talking about the historical da uh, data being used to create your budgets, which we're in the process of, and then stress testing it as to how variables would impact it. We then talked about the conversation of calculating projected revenue gains in hospitality, which is different than the forecasting. We identified the, the, the difference in the forecasting, the four methods of process, uh, the, the sources of the data that you would need to do this with and how you would extrapolate that. And we hinted and discussed at that point certain calculations that we're going to talk about today uh, as to ways that that can get used, especially when you are trying to make the case of variations to just doing the same old, same old with amped up numbers, which is usually how budget processes usually work in our world. So show 423, dun, ta, 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 okay, is about, sorry, I had to click and make sure I read it as I wanted it to read. The problem with lifetime value, it's not getting used and it's the core of today's analytics. As I mentioned, with going back to show 421 up to now, this is our third. The next week is actually going to be interesting as we talk about making a new advanced way of marketing budgets or creating marketing budgets and how that almost turns into a symbiotic statement of marketing and revenue budgets. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of thinking that forward well, next week, that might be our, our final direction with this series of conversations. But today... It's really talking about lifetime value. And I bring this up out of real life circumstances for me uh, as I deal with clients, obviously at this time of year with budgets and what is our forecast. And again, talking about projections of lost revenue. I bring that into the dialogue and they're like, well, we're talking about forecasts. I'm like, no, forecasts are based on the modification of current data. Projections of revenue are based on the forecast of unknown data. Uh, what uh, would the variables be if they were this? Like I said, stress testing is the forensic manipulation of data as you see it and what would happen if it changes. Forecasted future value is about manipulating options that aren't in your current plan and what are the potential value propositions related to those. And lifetime value, LTV, is a uh, key metric associated with um, how this happens. It's, it's a process of value related to how you would calculate future revenues. Now, it's not as far-fetched as saying that you're creating an, a completely alternate universe marketing campaign and you're looking for production from that. This is about taking what you know of your current engagements and understanding the future value, the lifetime value of that guest to your business. Now, in very simple terms, lifetime value calculations are, can be very simple. Uh, if you have a person coming to your property and they purchase their stay based on durability of uh, occupancy and ADR, so acquisition, okay? So if your ADR is 100 and they stay, stay four days, their purchase is $400, okay? That's their purchase amount. Now, that's very overly simplistic, but let's just keep with it. So that single purchase of $400, okay? So 
you can go and say, well, that guest was worth $400 for the engagement with me. Now you begin to talk about modifiers as to the value of that guest. Now that they've experienced your product and, and they've enjoyed your product and you're hoping that they do from the review and CRM engagements that you have with them and so forth. You're hoping that that guest is going to come back as a repeat guest. But put math to that. How often are they going to come back? Over how many years are they going to come back? Now, simple math, just to have a simple stick in the sand for a lifetime value, is if they acquired one purchase this year for $400, let's just take that and say next year they'll do the same thing. And the next year after that. And the next year after that. How many years you count is truly based on what is, you can use data, which you should, and the calculation of repeat guess, which we'll get to in, in, as we get deeper into this. Um, but just a stick in the sand, you have industry average, you have brand average, and more importantly, you should figure out your average. How often does the guest come back? To be safe, say four years. Just let's make it a nice, easy number, four years. So that person that purchased the example we gave of $100 ADR, four nights, $400 total purchase value. For this year and four more, okay, represents 20, oh, excuse me, 20, $2,000 in full value. Um, the idea of taking that number has a particular purpose. And, and one is the calculation of true channel cost. It also has the calculation, which is a very important one, of cost of acquisition. So in our marketing world, and I'm sorry, I'm pausing and thinking through this because I want to keep it as basic in conversation. And I'm not trying to act as I'm really smart about this, just basic in conversation as to how to approach this cost of acquisition as it relates to lifetime value. This guest has stayed with you this year, and we're assuming that they stay only once per year for the next four years past this one. So five years total. Okay. And excuse me, that's $4,000. No, excuse me, two thousand dollars. Math is bad today. Um, yeah, and I'm talking about numbers. Yay, good combo. Um, the idea is that that is a calculation based on what it costs to get them to stay this first time, which created the repetition of their value. And say, for instance, uh, you look at the cost of what they, what channels they were acquired on. Their att your attribution relationship with them. And this is where the GA four conversation comes in today. Um, the idea that you can see more accurately now all the contributing factors associated with that, that cost of guest acquisition. How much it cost for us to get in the door this time that we are assuming based on quality of service and quality of product that they're gonna come back once a year for the next four years after this. So that their total worth is $2,000. And say for instance, it cost us $100. Now, how, does it, how, did this, how do I get a stick in the sand for that? Well, because if you look at, for every 100 people coming to your website, uh, two of them click on something. Uh, that 98 of them did not actually do anything about your website. Remember that conversion of your website, you know, say 2%. Okay. So two people out of a hundred clicked on something in your website. And let's say out of those two people, uh, a 10th of them, which is a fractional amount that is not defined by an individual person. Okay. Now, let's make it easy numbers. 10 people clicked on it. Okay. And of that two people book something. There you go. We'll just make an artificial number since we're making artificial numbers. So those two people out of the hundred actually purchased something, but you had to pay for those hundreds of people, the hundred people that paid through your paid campaigns to come to your website. They, those hundred people came because you had an ad in Google ads. So all of what you spent for those people, okay, to come to your website has to be diluted over the actual purchases. So if it worked out to being, Let's make these numbers nice and round. A dollar per person to get to your to your website, and two and, and and ten people clicked, and two people purchased. Then those two people have to take on the whole value of what it cost the hundred people to get to. So those two people have to suck up a hundred dollars. So each one of those for that channel, keeping it simple, was a fifty dollar cost of acquisition. Okay. So if you look at the fifty dollars cost of acquisition, going back to our original numbers of uh, a single purchase of $100 ADR, four nights day, $400 for that, $50 to your $400, okay? You're dealing with a, 
Oh my gosh, math is bad for me today. 25. You're looking at about a 10, uh, 8% cost of acquisition since we're keeping fluffy numbers. <laughs> Meaning that for that $400 acquisition, you had to spend that much money. Uh, the, 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 $20 to get that. So our math is really being a problem for me. Either I'm being distracted or I'm just not calculating through. But the idea is you have a cost of acquisition for that single purchase. And say, for instance, it was a 10% cost. Let's just make a round. So that 10% cost then is applied to that single purchase. And you're looking at it for this year's budget saying, okay, well, that's an expensive channel or that's a decent channel. There's a 10 to 1 return. We're fine. Uh, that's, a, that's an acceptable cost value. But if you multiply the lifetime value of that guest and the repetition of the guest, because you're not going to need to spend as much. You'll have to spend something potentially. Hopefully you've moved them to other channels that have less cost to keep them connected. CRM, um, memberships and or uh, the fact they've already rebooked, uh, whatever you've moved them into the funnel of, of acquisition with. There will be some residual cost per year. We're not going to get cluttered in that conversation today. There's never a zero cost unless they've already pre-booked, right? Um, but the, the cost of acquisition then gets diluted against the full lifetime value of $2,000, not just the single purchase value of $400. And so all of a sudden it goes from a 10 to one return, which is in itself already satisfactory, okay, to a, two, to a 22 to one, 24 to one return, which is incredibly valuable because now you've created that wheel momentum. Once you get in motion, Newton's wheel, you know, uh, you got in motion, um, you are reducing the amount of money necessary to bring that person back while optimizing the revenue they're purchasing. So in that simple lifetime value calculation, you're assuming very simple numbers, single point acquisition per year for a short duration of four years. It might be longer. Actually, it used to be longer that we used to calculate lifetime value to it. And, and several different industries approach it in several different ways as to what that value proposition is in the repurchase. Think of automotive industry that the person purchased a vehicle and then they'll purchase another one in five years. Okay. So the lifetime value that guest, if if you pay if you sell them two more cars, okay, over the course of the next 10 years, you compound the value of that first acquisition. Okay. That lifetime value makes it really incredibly enticing for the cost it took to get them to purchase the first time. Doesn't mean there's no cost associated with the residual return of them, but it's a diminished cost. Okay, so that's lifetime value calculation. The other thing I was referring to is cost of acquisition, the, the amount of money it took for us to get to them. Now, a lot of people, and this is the part that I'm referring to in our topic today of uh, the problem with lifetime value is not getting, it's not getting used and it's the core of today's analytics, is you have the ability now to better define the residual value of a guest engagement than you've ever had in the history of us being able to do this. Now, there are things that are working against us as to uh, tracking the engagement of our relationship with the guests. Just now, uh, next week, on Monday, iOS 14 fully rolls out. Not that people already haven't, or Apple hasn't already been reducing their cookie duration to seven days and not allowing longer durations. Um, you are uh, dealing with the fact that a lot more people are opting out and or blocking by using platforms like DuckDuckGo and so forth to not even allow analytical tracking. So you're getting a reduced sample amount of engagement inherently by the users themselves, um, which means that you have to imply a lot more data based on the data that you're getting compared to the entire spectrum uh, ecosystem of your guests. Your PMS will always be your point of truth on historical guest data. That is the place where the transactions occurred. So any information related to your PMS is always your core source of truth when it comes to how much you actually sold, to whom did you actually sell it? How often does it happen? So now let's start talking about numbers that do influence lifetime value and cost of acquisition. So as an exercise, I did this with a hotel that was looking to develop a membership program. And they were comparing themselves to a lot of the membership programs that are out there. And I say membership programs are actually frequency programs. We've had these dialogues in the live show before where the brand incentives of, oh, stay with us 10 times this year and you're entitled to a free bottle of water. Wow, that's a reward for loyalty. Um, they put the carrot at the end of the stick that you have to prove worthy to get whatever it is that they're offering. And yet the guest is looking at it going, I don't know if I like you guys that much to make that kind of commitment. 
Uh, you're telling me that if I go through these hoops and do these many times with staying with you, that there's a value reward at the end. There's a, there's a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Wonder if I don't like you as much as I first thought I liked you or wonder if I had bad experiences in the process, but I'm dedicated to getting to that rainbow end. Um, and the reward doesn't match the effort. That's what a lot of these things are doing because the value wasn't in the frequency of your stay, albeit it's a value all the same to the brand in particular. It's more about the retainment of your data. The more you engage with that brand, the more they are aware of your patterns of performance and behavior, the more about your travel pattern, the more about your demands for travel pattern, the more div divining differences between how you travel, whether it's family, whether it's business, it's combinations of both, how often, how many times, what is your preferences as you begin to share that data about like, I like extra pillows or I want more coffee things or whatever, that begins to help them target the future lifetime value that you represent. That's the real value of the membership program. So going back to my story of talking about this with a client about developing a membership program, I told them that they should invert this process. They should create a membership program that is based on immediately rewarding the people that have demonstrated the value that they are to their company. And I'll talk about that in a second. The second of it is, is that anybody that is not in your direct channel, and I say this of OTA production or uh, wholesaler production or anything else that is outside of your direct channel, Okay, and even if initially for this program, I said everybody, including your direct channel, you should offer this up. I told them to offer the second highest tier values, keeping the highest tier values to your most loyal and engaged guests, which again we'll get to. But offer them the best value for it, right off the bat. You have to do nothing for this, but we're going to give this to you so that you get to experience us in the best way possible. If it involves room upgrades, you're getting the room upgrade. If it involves a discount of their food and outlets, you're getting a discount of their food outlets. If you get preference to a beach chair or a golf tee time or a spot, you're getting it. If you enjoyed that and you, you do that enough with us by the end of the year, you keep it. If you don't, it goes away or gets reduced. So rather than waiting for the guest to prove their worthiness for them to handle out some bobble at the end, I told them they should hand out the value at the front and make it where the person gets addicted to it and wants to keep that level of engagement. Like, I really like coming back to this place and I really like the rewards I get and the treatment I get because they're acknowledging that they want my perpetual continued lifetime value engagement. That's where it came into break. Now, going back to the highest tiered people, and this goes back to lifetime value. One of the first things I told them was three categories of information you need to gather. First, who out of the past year has spent the most money with you outside of group blocks? And even then, I'd say make a list for that, but that's for another reason. Who as transient business has spent the most money with you? Great. Who, separate list, has spent the most days with you? Good. Who is in combination of both. Who's at the pinnacle top of the food chain of who spent the most money and the most time with you ever? Immediately reward them with something valuable. Thank them for nothing other than acknowledging that you are now aware of how important they are to your perpetual business. And you may look at it and go, Lord, geez, that's only what, uh, nine, 10, 14 days out of the year. It's only gonna be, you know, 15 to $3,000. Doesn't seem like it's working. Yes, it is. Because it's not just their continued relationship with you that is important, which obviously it is because of their frequency and dollar spend, but it's also their impact on others. Humanizing all of this and realizing that people are authorities. We see this in the terminology of technology and then they have influencers. Before it used to be um, you were kind of the go-to for your social group. If uh, in my neighborhood... If uh, somebody was going to buy a new TV, they know I'm a geek. They come over, hey, I'm thinking about buying a new TV, but you know about it, knowing that I do know about it, or I just told them I already bought a TV. Um, and I'll tell you all the things that I found and what I thought was this and this and this. Not that they're going to buy the same TV as me, not even they're going to buy the same brand as me. But that insight of information, that, that influencer aspect of it, exists back then and exists amplified even now. I'm not saying rushing out and grabbing influencers, but these people that stay with you that many times and spend that much money, those people on those three lists have an influence value because if somebody says, well, I'm thinking about going down to wherever the location of the, your hotel or resort is, this person is going to speak up. Oh, well, if you're going to go there, 
we love going to XYZ. Man, I've, I've, I've been there, what, we've been there X number of days, or we've, you know, we've, we spend we spend when we're down there. Whatever it is they're going to say about, but they're going to be an authority on your property. That has nothing to do with content that you put on your website. That has nothing to do with the ad campaigns that you're spending in their market. It has nothing to do with the social engagement you're doing. It has everything to do with the inception of the influence they have on the person that they're talking to or sharing their experiences with. And there are tools out there that they can even amplify that more. Things like what Flip2 is doing with the discovery program and so forth. That, that expansion of shareability. This is what I'm enjoying. You should enjoy it too. Or if you want to enjoy it, I can get the same deal for you, which is one of the Flip2 things it does. These, these ways of expanding the influencer's value are incredibly valuable. Why am I bringing this all up about future values and cost of acquisitions? Because everything costs. The bottle of water that brand gives you after being loyal for going to their hotel brands for 10 times still costs money. It might be a nickel, but it still costs something. The upgrades that you give because of the cost of turning that room, it's not a free room. A larger room requires larger amounts of time, labor time, product time, product time, eh, product amount that are, are to that room. Everybody that operates a hotel knows what room types, what it costs to turn a room in the sense of tangible product, labor resource, and regenerative FF&E. When I finally have to start replacing, there's maintenance costs and everything else. There's a fixed cost per room. Whether it's $24 a room or $48 a room or however high it is, it's, it should be a calculated number that every hotel knows about every room type it has. Every room type has a cost value relationship to it. It's not a free room. So with that, cost of, ac of, of, of customer acquisition is all tied with that. The discount you give to your food is a cost because it's less revenue you got from it. Now, you want the correlation to be that by selling the product even at a discounted amount it's at least selling the product and not letting it go stale or get lost just like your hotel rooms perishable product and that balances by far ahead of whatever discounts you offer as an incentive but the incentives the cost of the upgrades the amenity values the displacement of other business because of the prioritization you give people all those are measurable dollar amounts that turn into your cost of acquisition for a customer, CAC. That cost has to be compared to the value overall of the guest. So take my example of what I told a client to do for their membership program. You're now giving room upgrades, late checkouts, which cause labor costs and issues. Um, room upgrades have their own cost to it. Discounts for food and beverage has their cost to that. That's a mathematically calculated number, okay? That's the cost of this program and the cost of keep keeping this guest. Now, you paid your marketing dollars, as we made a very poor example of my math on, uh, that there's a cost that has to be assumed by those who actually converse, become converted, burden to those that didn't, okay, burden from them. All the costs to, to get the audience size to translate that conversion, that has to be burdened by the conversions. So you have the cost of acquisition initially, and nothing goes for free, future tense, all of your efforts to maintain communication, the platform costs to do that, like, you know, Flip2 isn't free. And I'm referring to them as an example, but, you know, it's an example worthy of making. Um, all these other platforms, CRM and platforms, it costs you money. It costs labor. These are all things that can be calculated and at best parameter to have a very good guesstimate of. You can actually dilute it over time. If you have historical numbers, you can modify it to the total numbers of engagements and divide that to an individual cost and apply that to the individual cost of acquisition, which you should do. Anyways, you develop this whole cost of acquisition, and each year, the subsequent cost of, cost of making that can continue in that communication with the guest and that, that lifetime value of recurrence. But here's the payoff. We simplified the lifetime value formula as being just a single re, uh, re duplication of that one purchase annually. Taking the example of the list of what I told you of people that spend more or stay longer, uh, or hopefully in combinations of both, okay, that's an amplifier. If somebody stayed not just once with you, but four times with you, now you're talking about repetition of those four times over the span of the X number of years. Now you start talking about how can we expand their, their spend with us. Now there's a whole nother ratio of value that you're beginning to talk about. And that is how can you modify the purchase behavior of your lifetime value proposition? 
to give you an analogy to another industry, we sold them a basic car when they bought it from us the first time. But now that they're back the second time, they're in a different financial scenario. They, they have a different demand. Maybe they have a family now. And maybe we can sell them a more expensive car because they're loyal to us because of they came back because they appreciated what we sold them. They appreciated our engagement with them and the value with them and our communications with them and everything else with them. And so we're going to sell them a more uh, valuable car. Okay. Better margin for us. And then after that, maybe even more so. Okay. They, now they're in a different level of demographics and they want to spend more money on a more affluent car. That's an example. Same too with our guests. Membership is a lead to getting them to want to spend more. People that think that their perception of saving money means that that money now is freed up to be spent on something more that they want. So instead of buying the basic breakfast, they decide to go for the custom breakfast. Just saying. Maybe instead of just one round of golf, they decide to two because you give them a discount on the first one and maybe a discount on the second one. Um, maybe because you upgraded their room, they decide they want to stay longer and add an extra day to their stay. These enhancements of the value of the lifetime are modifiers you can apply to your lifetime value. So now you start getting additional modifiers in your lifetime value program. It's just not value and frequency, okay? But it's now value times frequency times expansion times the frequency of all of that happening repetitively. So if a person is coming to you four times a year and you increase their purchase power with you or purchase spend with you by 10%, that factor of four times, 10% increase each time to the next four times increasing by another 10%, okay? And we're not even expanding the frequency yet. We're just expanding the value of each transaction value times the next 10, four times, times 10 times percentage growth of their spend, times that again, and even maybe if you extend the years to be more realistic to the actual full engagement data that you have about a repeat guest, okay? You see where that number balloons. I could say geometrically expands, but I'll just go balloons <laughs> because it truly really does. The value now of that engagement with that guest, that guest is exponential. The balloons, the importance of that person and the influence that they provide is also measurably trackable. What they do in engagement with others and how that impacts other purchase, or purchase decisions of other people can be tied to that person. So as they balloon their relationship with you and they prove highly valuable in that relationship with you and you're very happy with them and you're you're doing all the things right to keep them with you and all the things right that keeps them wanting to spend more money with you and come back with you as least as often as they have been if not more is also being mirrored with the others that they've shared that experience with that begin that process as well this bottom of the hill mentality of a lifetime value is critical in your modality of how you approach business OK, and that's the problem with lifetime value right now. It's not being used given the world of GA4 that we have. It isn't realized how incredibly valuable this new ability of getting data and using that data in the scope of, of lifetime value cultivation creates. OK, and and with with the AI and I'll use this from one of my team members, Aaron, um, a, the, the, he explained it eloquently when I was struggling with the custom audiences, what they call segmentation now. I was always of the old school of de define the persona from who you want to pursue and then create a structure to net them in, so to speak. You know, target them to bring them, it becomes a self-fulfilling circle. And he said, no, Lauren, you have to look at it as creating audiences of how you, what you want to track for how people engage with you and then going back and identifying them in the ways that make sense that you can then use that information to say, they do this, they come to my accommodations and purchase a room. That's great. They looked at my booking engine in the past 30 days and didn't book. That's a definition too. Then who are these people that are doing this? And then you begin to create the persona relationship, understanding who those people are. So you can better define whether or not that's a usable insight for other ways of approaching, getting the message in front of them. All that being said, small sidebar there, he said, G4, Google Analytics, it's not so much about being uh, uh, how we've traditionally taken analytics all this time with Urchin and Google doing everything, whereas it's a matter of measuring metrics. 
He said G4 is about Google's desire to define why tracking signals. Okay. That it's about uh, creating audiences. Okay. And that resonated with me that we're looking at analytics still from the pathway of what do I want to look at compared to looking backwards, where are all these people coming from and defining them as to their source of, of value. And that's a different perspective. It's, it's either here or there. It's, it's two different, it's a polarity of perspective. And, but the idea that GA4 is based more on creating audiences than it is about analytics. The analytics is the byproduct of the audiences. It's giving you numbers related to what it's seeing. Uh, that makes a defining difference. That whole value proposition of looking at the current ability, not just for attribution string, allowing Google to tell you its magic box of how it thinks that the little pieces work together of how much social was involved in your ads and your content and your website and, and all, anything else that contributed to it, display ads, OTT, what, uh, meta search, whatever, and tracking all that as to a value proposition of this business, which it does. If you open it up, if you stop blinding yourself to Wednesday blinding, if you stop trying to equate it to how you used to look at data and look at it for the value that it can now be presented to you, massive perspective difference. Anyways, digressing on a tangent. The idea that lifetime value and the ballooning of value of that particular person and the engagement of them and the ability to track how that engagement occurs with them and the value propositions that they find valuable and rewarding them for that relationship and the expansion of that to other growth by their influence and creating that same pattern with them means that it's not about what I call the Disney marketing method. I don't mean any disrespect to Disney, but Disney's a monster in the sense of volume of people, not monster in any negative sense at all. Um, but the idea that the way I call Disney marketing is they come up and say, hey, I want to buy a ticket. Well, it's $200. Woo, I don't want to spend $200 for it. Well, then get online because there's somebody right behind you that will. And this is true. That's the Disney marketing. Okay. I'm only worried about the single transaction. And if you don't like the single transaction, sorry, somebody right behind you coming to my website does. If you if you think my ADR is too high, maybe it is for you. But there's somebody behind you that doesn't think it's too high and they're willing to pay it because that's what they want is what we offer. And it sounds arrogant and it comes off that way maybe slightly, but it, it is the bravado of knowing your value and worth and saying that I'm not going to lower my rate just because you don't like the rate I'm offering. My quality is there. My product is there. My locations there. All the variables that you want to define as being valuable for why you're asking for your rate, then that's the rate you offer. And not everybody's going to want that. Um, I, I'm from a small story, uh, I had a beach hotel resort that we ran and we had a beautiful beach area and we had tons of wonderful weddings out there. And we constantly got people that would come over and go, Hey, uh, we just want everybody to park in the parking lot. We just want to walk out to your beach and we want to take some pictures uh, for our wedding uh, with your backdrop. And they got mad at us when we told them, no, we can't let you. And they're like, why? It's, we're not doing it. We're not going to bother anybody. We're just going to go right over there and uh, the sun sets. We want to take some pictures and so forth. And it sounds terrible. But the idea was this. We said, listen, to do that with us. You have to have the wedding with us at this price. You can't, well, we'll have the wedding with, but you know, we just want, you know, be able to do this and have some cocktails around the bar afterwards. No, our base wedding was, I don't know, something 20,000 at the time. And I know it sounds terrible, but it's terrible if we did it for the people that paid to have the luxury and the uniqueness of what we had to offer to be able to do that say, oh, well, you know, they here they dropped $20,000 or something to have their wedding to have that happen. And then they're watching a, parade of people that didn't pay that go out to the very same spot they were in and get the same thing that they were doing, but they paid and they didn't. It's, it's, it's okay. And again, there's, there's the, the concept of you, you like doing what you can for the people that may not be in the margin for being able to do it with you financially. But the people that built the paid for the building to be built there didn't do it. So they could turn into just, let's just let anybody do that in front of us. It's, it's, it's the idea of what business was born for in that sense. It also made it very special when we could offer that to people that couldn't financially pay for it. It added value to it because the integrity of what it was really worth made the impact on them that they felt special because they were allowed to do it without having to have that financial amount. And those circumstances were cherished. And the people that did pay and they said, wow, you know, they gave that to them, but 
what a wonderful story, heartfelt. That seemed like a beautiful thing that they did. And they actually think of it positively. They don't think that they were robbed of something. They appreciate the fact that it was given to these type of people for whatever merit they had for doing it that way, and that they don't feel ill for that. That kind of perception of value has to be maintained. If I go over and have uh, uh, Mercedes Benz, what are those little bricky ones? The, the, uh, the ones that they are the, the uh, very expensive ones. And I just sold it for $20,000. You'd wonder either what is broken or two, is it real? Or if I sold enough of them, people will begin to diminish the value of the vehicle. Because look, you're asking for 150000 over here, but this guy's selling it for 20000 Either he's really silly, which it would be, or it's not worth 150000 Perception of value is a key element to what we do. Same thing we do with ADRs. So that perception of value, where I brought all this up for, is also upon your guests and their lifetime value. If you treat every guest coming in your door for what they're worth as a lifetime value, you'll get their lifetime value. If you treat them like I call the Disney model, where if they don't like it and they leave, knowing that you're basically telling them somebody behind you is going to pay the rate that you're asking for, then you're not going to get them to stay. Not those people. But the idea of calculating lifetime value changes the perspective of your costs of acquisition in the year that incepts this, the inception of that a relationship with them. If you're only looking at selling one person, one rate, one day for one stay, you'll treat them at that level of value. You'll be like, yeah, okay, so you don't like my breakfast. I ain't seeing you again. You're just driving through. What do I care? Two things with that. One, the lifetime value of that individual is gone. Two, any influence on anybody else that turns into a transaction, even a singular transaction is gone, let alone the lifetime value of that person. And I'm only talking about one person they're talking to. And we know we don't only talk to just one other person. So it's an it's a ripple in a pond negatively as to treating that person as if they don't have durable value with you. If you treated everybody as, who is it? A friend of mine says, you met every woman as if they were going to be your wife how nice you would be to everybody. <laughs> uh, same to in reverse, I guess. So the idea that everybody's treated for the worth of their, I mean, there's, there's analogies out there of uh, the story of a man giving his daughter a, a classic car that was kept in the barn and going through going to the used car dealer versus a collector and, you know, measure your own worth. Lots of analogies of this, but the idea that looking at a guest for their singular purchase value is a disrespect to both your business as to why it's built by brick and mortar and why you pay if you charge what you charge, but also to the person more specifically, because that's not them. It's just not their single purchase. And yes, I may only be traveling through your town once, but as the saying goes, never say never. Just because I don't think I'll ever come back through again doesn't mean I might not come back through again. So why not treat me as if I was? And the memories that are made by sharing with people, treating them with the value that they could be, that lifetime value perspective of, my gosh, I might see you again next year. I might see you again next this year. This is, uh, we're going to see each other a lot. You invest in friendships, you invest in relationships, you invest in guest relationships. It's the core value of what you do this for. And lifetime value is a huge way of explaining that to your team uh, as to the value of your engagements with your guests, the value that you place on your guests, how you want the guests to be treated. It's all interwoven with your HR relationships as well. Because as it's always famously said, take care of your team, your team takes care of your guests. That has to be a cultivated culture in your organization. I don't want to divest off the value of problems with lifetime value getting used in today's analytics, but it's beyond just the numbers of revenue optimization and development. It goes into your ethos of how you treat people. If you look at everyone from a lifetime value perspective, it completely enhances your service level. It completely makes it... Um, a function that people baseline in their conversations about their guest at a higher level than the detriment. I can give you actually a first person example of something that happened with me. When I first became a GM at a Hilton here in Florida, um, I was first tasked with a problem. I was uh, having an exec meeting and the front desk agent came back to the exec meeting going, he's here again. And everybody just rolled their eyes. I was new, they were there for a while. And I said, I'm sorry. He says, yep, um, Tom, let's make his name up. Um, he's out front again. What's he want this time? One of my team members said, well, he still wants uh, to use the parking spot. Oh, this guy never learned. I'm like, well, hold on, wait, hold on. 
fill me in with but Tom. I'm trying to, you know, I'm new GM. Well, tell me about what's going on. Let me figure out what's going on. Why you guys are all rolling your eyes, whatever. And they said, this guy, um, he stays a lot at the hotel because he has a business uh, in, this, in the, where we're at. And he uh, travels over persistently. And he keeps car over here. And it's a very expensive car. It's a Mercedes sedan something or other. This goes back a few years, by the way. Um, and he wants for safety and for the fact that he's, you know, this is his second home for our practical purposes. He wants it to be where he can always persistently get to it, which is out in front where we have our shuttle buses and so forth and what have you. And um, not that it's in the way, but we get asked by other guests, why does that guy get to park there? And I don't. So I said, so, okay, I understand that. So what, why, why are you rolling your eyes about him? And he's like, everything's a problem for him. Um, we, we've, we, we, we've changed his rooms. We've tried, you know, we put him in the worst rooms because every, no room is right for him. He always has this particular problem with this or that. He wants the same thing over and we, if we don't have that room, he gets, you know, upset and, 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 and constantly telling us how we want to get moved to the room. And he constantly wants us to move the room. I'm listening to the story. And I'm going, huh? So I, I asked the revenue manager at the time, actually reservations manager, this is how far back it goes, how often Tom has been staying with us each year. It was like 150 days. I'm like, what? So does he get a super discount? No, he just gets the honors rewards programs and so on. So we have a man that is staying with us 150 days. And he likes a certain room because of the size and has a desk. Wow. Duh, brain, you know, why wouldn't you? If you're working, you're living, you want the extra space, and you keep shoving him in little crappy little rooms to discourage him from bugging you. And he wants to use a parking space that is not being used by us regularly, but creates conversations that you don't like with other guests when they ask when they see him pull in there and park why they can't do that. Huh. Okay, I'll go talk to him. So I go out to the front. And they're all kind of like peeking around the corner, you know, watching. And I walk up to Tom and uh, I, I just reach out my hand. And he, he, he knows this. Oh, so you must be the new GM around here. And he's expecting what he's been expecting from the team before I got there. Same stuff. Well, you know, we can't do this. And this is this. And this is. And I just went up to him and said, Tom, first off, I want to thank you very much for being the guest that you are for us, that you are here as much as you are. And I want to reward all aspects of that. Uh, that parking space, I understand that you're just asking about and so forth. They told me that what you're asking for is go right ahead. Please keep in mind that if we ever need it for our own functionality, we'll ping you and just say, hey, look, can you not use the space today? Because uh, I need two shuttle buses today and I need the spot there for immediate usage and so forth. And he's like, uh, yeah, yeah, of course. I, yeah, that's no problem. And, you know, the room type you're looking for, the, the King Suite or whatever the heck it was at the time, I'll always have you slated for it. Because uh, you've been always persistent. You've not really ever canceled. Just do us a favor that if for any reason you feel you're not going to make it, let us know. Because as you know, it's a very popular style room for us. And a lot of times our groups want those ones and so forth. But I will always make sure that you have it pre into that room type. And this is way before you could ever permanently assign room types. I was just going to make it a note every time on his reservation days ahead that we were booked into it. So we didn't oversell those types of rooms. I said, but if ever I did... I will give you plenty of heads up that I just couldn't make it work that time, but my priority is to always make it work. He's like, yeah. I said, I noticed, uh, you know, you don't really uh, come breakfast down too often and stuff like that. I says, yeah, yeah. It just gets too expensive. No problem. You're going to have a permanent, I don't know what I gave him, 20, 25% discount on breakfast every day. Please come down every day. Um, always make your breakfast. Heck, I might join you for a cup of coffee in the morning. Totally blew this guy backwards. He's like, I did not expect this conversation. I said, well, I'm sorry that it was a surprise to you because it should have been one that was there the first time this all started occurring for you. I said, uh, you represent a, a huge investment into us and your dedication to us should be rewarded. I got to tell you, he was the best eyes and ears I ever had in a hotel. He would tell me where there was paint that was faded. He would tell me if there was wallpaper that was peeling. He would tell me about if there was an issue with guests that my security may not have caught. He would tell me the sentiment from people he was having breakfast around as to how group activity was going. He was incredibly polite to our entire team. Never was a problem about the parking that he gave him to use. Was And, and, and actually, 
it, it turned into a positive when guests would say, why does he get to park there and not us? He stays with us half a year. Oh, yeah. And that makes it convenient for him to be able to, and, oh, wow. And it turned into the fact that we were so, that because we we're willing to do that for someone, that showed that we cared about our guests, that we weren't just treating everyone like numbers. The whole positive fact, it was one of my proudest things I did as a GM was turn that from zero to hero. Because the team all of a sudden realized the dark path that they were on and how counterproductive. They were actually discouraging this guy to come back because they didn't like dealing with him. Yet he represented our largest user of our hotel over an annual period. And but he wasn't getting discounts a lot of times. I mean, you know, honors programs and so forth. And even then, every once in a while, I'd throw him a discount if he was staying more than five days on one of his stints. But like, hey, dude, you're here for five days. We have a uh, offer for you know five plus days stay of an extra ten percent discount. We just put it onto your bill. And he was flabbergasted that we did that without say, well, you lucked out, you didn't book that way, you should have booked that way. No, we watched out for him. Those kind of things translate to the lifetime value calculation that I'm talking about today in huge ways. Because then I started getting business from people going, oh, we're a friend of Tom's. You know, Tom told us that if we come here, this is where we have to stay. They would be actively seeking out me or my front desk manager because she turned a <laughs> turn perspective on it. And, and my reservations manager turned perspective on it. And all of a sudden, he had a bunch of friends that watched out for him. And the, the, the people he would send, you know, he said, don't stay anywhere else. Stay there. Talk to Lauren. Talk to Debbie. Talk, you know, and, and just it turned into an incredible positive for what started out as an incredible negative. And it was, it was one of my proudest things that uh, I, I, I saw for what I thought it was worth and changed the, the story and the, the optics on it. Both buzzwords that didn't exist back then. Um, so the lifetime value proposition, if you infuse it into your uh, perspective, not just from a monetization point of view, but also from a cultural point of view, uh, has huge positive ramifications for both. Um, the cost acquisition, uh, uh, cost to acquire customers, is a mathematical number that should always change. Uh, I don't ask people what their CAC is. Uh, as a static, I say, what is your current CAC? What is your, this year's CAC? Because every year has different variable costs. You have to infuse in your capital expense into your CAC. You have to infuse in your labor uh, variations if you're short on labor and high on overtime. That changes your CAC because it influences your cost per room. It influences your cost per service when it comes into your restaurants. It influences a lot of things. And so it's a variable number, as is also your lifetime value, because as your ADRs change, or as the frequency pattern that you monitor of the core three. I could say there's a fourth if you wanted to be a variant to it, where I said the core three was ones that spend the most money, ones that spend the most time, one that, the ones that spend the combination of both. But the fourth one, if you just want to create it, was the frequency one. It's not how many days, but how frequently they came back. Now, it is very similar to the number of total days because it accumulates a day count. So it's kind of half of the same thing. But that frequency pattern actually gives you better insights into the auto audience profile because if they're coming back frequently, unless they're retired and or have the uh, flexibility of time to be that often with you, that usually means that from a marketing perspective, there's different reasons for travel. And these are all the insights we're going to talk about next week. And that is creating advanced marketing budgets as to these kind of variables like, okay, if you're looking at frequency patterns of your guests and you isolate out your top 10 percentile of frequencies. If you guys, I'm going to give a little sneak peek to next year's next week's conversation. If you take out your top 10 percent frequency users, look at their sourcing of business types. Are they affiliated with group transactions and did they residual into transient? Did they just come back frequently because there's a reason they're working in and there needs to be an LNR engagement with a company next door? Are they doing this outside of their block, inside their block? Um, is, is there a variation of their travel type, family one, business two, corporate three, whatever? Look at those, and that gives you interesting sources of business. And what you'll find a lot of times is the source geographically of those frequency people is a highly targeted feeder market that has different dimensions of value to you rather than just the seasonality that most people equate to your feeder market base. I know, it sounds like tangents. Way more granular on our discussion next week because we really want to get into advanced marketing because we have analytics tools now with data that we can ask hard questions like lead time and engagement interest versus like um, 
uh, uh, highest volume of traffic days, overlaying that onto a calendar map to see how it overlays your prefunctory ones of events and holidays and business cycles to see your patterns of traffic online in comparison to your business cycle of either revenues or occupancies, which are two good variables to run. And so you're nice to get in this heat map calendar for your year to see all of your event driven stuff, all your holiday driven stuff, your business cycle stuff, your occupancy numbers, your ADR numbers, and your traffic numbers. And you begin to see variations in those lines of heat of how much traffic prior to engagement and, con and conversion prior to occupancy. And you begin to see the funnels develop for each, the comet trails of each of these things, both in your business cycle, your events, and your holiday cycle. We're going to talk more about that next week, um, about defining with the data that's available in, in GA4, how to create those kind of things. I, no, I'm not excited about this stuff. <laughs> so, again, the problem with lifetime value, it's not getting used, or at least by far not as much as it should be used. And uh, it is at the core of today's analytics because you now have the data to use in calculating more accurately or with more use capability, the lifetime value proposition. So that's our story this week. Thank you very much for putting through it. And sorry for the bad math at the beginning. Uh, I actually am gonna have to write this down. It's like, wait, what's over there figuring out the cost per acquisition, 100 people, two actually converted. No, that's 10 to click, but two that converted. Sorry about the bad math at the beginning. The math does work. My brain just wasn't. Um, for those of you watching us on TV, thank you so very much for watching us on Roku TV, Google TV, Amazon TV, Apple TV, Samsung TV. If you're watching us on your uh, gaming council for media, Twitch, we're broadcasting there. If you're watching us on all the platforms we simulcast on, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, thank you so much for our multiple pages, multiple channels, lots of cool stuff. Uh, thank you for everyone doing that. We will have a recap on our audio podcast of the show today, as well as some tools related to what we talked about. Obviously, in our podcast, we always do a much more granular and shorter conversation about tools specifically related to the symbiotic relationship of our live show topic today. So we're talking about tools to calculate lifetime value, um, the, meth the math associated with it, and the, the funnel tools that work with it and so forth. Um, so that will be there. All of our podcasts all of these live shows are always on I Love Lucy reruns on the hospitality channel TV. Um, you can go there and catch up and, and search by broadcast date, search by topic, search by co-host. Um, we also uh, have our podcast channel, which is on 39 different platforms, including iHeartRadio, so forth and so on. You can also use it on Amazon's Alexa, uh, Amazon's Alexa, Google's uh, assistant and Apple Siri. Um, just ask them to play the podcast and it plays it. We're also 24 seven on the hospitality radio station. That's on 26 channels, um, platforms of distribution, or you can go to hospitalityradio.com and play the player back there. Uh, our podcasts and other people's podcasts, other hospitality podcasts I've put into these different. So we have a revenue management hour. We have a, a meta search hour. We have uh, marketing hours. And we also shift it to, we're doing, to start creating multi-language podcasts where we're taking our podcast and I'm translating with an uh, AI voice to be in Spanish as our first one. We're doing Spanish first. Uh, large audiences uh, listen to us and watch us in Spanish and thank you for doing that. As always, our, podca our podcasts and shows, um, we translate them into 11 languages, English being one of them. So 10 other, 10 other languages that are based on all the countries room. We're in 209 countries with the TV station. So we have a good audience to determine which are their most popular languages. We do all the romantic languages, Spanish, French, German, so forth. But we also do Filipino, Korean, Japanese, uh, Hindi. Um, yes, so we do quite a lot. Anyways, all of that being said, self-promotions aside, um, oh, Hospitality Marketing Club, peer pressure, peer, peer pressure, peer conversations, people that are, are professionals in the industry. Uh, it's a club you can join. You have to be doing hospitality marketing. We're not here to teach you to do hospitality or teach you how to do it better. Uh, and you go to hospitalitymarketing.club, put your email in, I send you a quiz, you pass the quiz, it shows you to understand what we're talking about. You get joining in the club, and now you have people you can talk to and ask questions you don't have other people to talk to. Because I'm sure when you walk around their halls, if you're doing this kind of stuff, you can start talking about crazy stuff like we talked about on the show today. You get that glazy little look, and look, oh, look, I'm going to get more coffee in the leave. Anyways, my name is Long Gray. Thank you for the privilege of your time, and I look forward to talking to you all next week.